Um, everybody, this is Sarah Gray from the board of the Central Chapter of INPS, and she's here to help facilitate the evening tonight. Normally, I am the facilitator of this meeting. However, tonight, I'll be the presenter. My name is Brooke Alford, and I'm the current president of the Central Chapter of uh, the Indiana Native Plant Society. Uh, I also am an educator at Marion County Purdue Extension. And I uh, do a lot of programming around composting, so I'm really glad you could all join us here tonight. Um, go, feel free to enter questions in the chat as we go. We can address them at the end of the presentation, unless there are some clarifying questions that need to be addressed along the way. Sarah will just step in and let me know if she sees something. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the presentation. Okay, that's not allowing me to get the view that I was looking for, but that's okay. We'll do without the notes this evening. So welcome again to Composting Demystified. It's kind of, this is intended to be kind of the 101 of home composting. Again, my name is Brooke Alford. I'm with the Marion County Extension Office where I'm an urban ag and natural resources educator. Um, this is just an acknowledgement. Please know that um, this institution is an equal opportunity provider and that we do strive to increase our diversity, equity, and inclusion. And this is the same acknowledgement in Spanish. So I wanted to start with a little bit about the history of composting. My colleague, uh, Michelle Jones, who is an a and educator in Morgan County, pulled this together and um, this history I found absolutely fascinating. I hope you do too. So the first reference that we see in composting um, was in 23 BC, found in clay tablets. And it was a manure-based composting. And then China in the first century BC, um, who utilized cook bones, manure, and silkworm debris. And then also a retired Roman general um, around 200 BC who wrote a book titled uh, Concerning the Culture of the Fields in which he describes composting as well. So it's really fascinating for me to see how far back this actually goes. And I'm sure that this is only you know, a small bit of what was going on so many years ago. So getting to the Middle Ages, medieval churches um, preserved this knowledge through writings and monasteries. And the uh, monks often worked with local community around sa sound agricultural practices um, that included composting. And here in the US, our compost history, George Washington um, was an ardent composting and Jefferson was not originally, however, when land became more expensive and labor um, than labor, he wrote to Washington to learn about composting. So what is composting? Kind of the 101s as it's today practice. So it is this controlled aerobic biological decomposition of organic materials. And it does provide a very rich amendment for the landscape. So thermodynamic composting is hot composting. And this is what we think of when we have piles that we're turning. The reason we're turning those is to keep them aerated. And as they sit and the microbes do their work, it really raises the temperature of the pile. Moldering composting is cold. So moldering is to decay or crumble away from the collapse. And that's not what we're going for. So um, when the thermo thermodynamics aren't right, if the pile is too dry, it's desiccating, too wet, it's considered rotting or putrefying. Um, and if it's too cold, again, it's moldering. So uh, these are things to consider when you're trying to optimize the health of your compost. But if you get the moisture, the air, the carbon to nitrogen ratio and the temperature in the pile just right, you're composting and you're making some of the richest amendment out there. Six factors in composting. 
the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And we're going to talk more here in just a few minutes about what are carbon sources and what are nitrogen sources. And those are part of the ingredients of the pile. And then the moisture content, you've got to keep that moisture up, but again, you don't want it too moist. Oxygen is very important for the microbes in this pile. And so um, there are different ways to ensure you're getting plenty of oxygen in the pile. The size of the ingredients. So that's what you're feeding the pile. Um, sawdust with the really small particulates can sometimes become compact, but then, whoops, we lost somebody. Hold on just a sec, there we go. Um, but then if you think of something like arborist chips or wood chips, those are pretty darn big particles, right? So they're gonna take a lot longer to decompose. Um, and then the size and the shape of the bin or the pile, uh, that's gonna make a big difference how large it is and how it's being kept. If it's um, uh, kind of more uh, squarish rather than flat or low and the temperature. And there is something, you can see the top of it in the pile that's in the pile over here to the right um, called a compost uh, thermometer. And it's probably about this long. It can kind of reach into that compost and give you uh, the temperature. This one appears at 150, which is a good temperature to be at. So these are the essential ingredients, carbon, nitrogen, air, and water. And we're gonna talk more about what are carbon ingredients and what are nitrogen ingredients. Carbon are what we call our browns, while nitrogens are our greens. Carbon we think of as an energy source and as a basic cell build building material for the microbes in the pile. They're doing the work of decomposing. Uh, think about our carbs when you think about the carbon. And here are some examples. And again, you're looking at a variety of different uh, materials from different sources. And these are sources that could be found in nature or they could be found in the house. When you think about um, napkins, paper towels, as long as they don't have any cleaning products on them, mixed paper like uh, newspaper and corrugated cardboard. Uh, with the corrugated cardboard, I always found it really fascinating when I've used that because the um, worms seem to really like that environment of the corrugation. For some reason, that's a really happy place for them. And the brown materials, you can think of them as kind of that's their nesting place, whereas the green materials or the nitrogen, that's their food. So they really often live more in their nesting brown material and then operate in the green material while they're feeding. So here are some CN ratios, some carbon to nitrogen ratios of um, different materials. Uh, you can see straw is kind of in the middle there and wood chips would be the highest. You know, that's some um, uh, very dense carbon material. And so it's going to take longer to decompose. Um, the reason we're talking about that C and ratio um, is really to be able to um, feed the microorganisms and allow them to break down the material. And if it gets too far out of whack, uh, they won't be able to do that. So if you were to put um, a material into the landscape, so use it as an amendment that's really high in nitrogen, that's going to start pulling, I mean, it's high in carbon, that's gonna start pulling uh, nitrogen. So as those um, microorganisms are utilizing that carbon, they're sucking the nitrogen out of your soil, which is so essential to healthy plants. So um, that's, that's an important aspect. Like with wood chips, they're great as a mulch. I use them all the time. They're free, they're good at keeping down weeds, but I don't want to incorporate them into the soil because that's gonna start robbing the, the nitrogen from the soil. And then nitrogen. Um, consider these crucial components of nucleic acids, amino acids, and enzymes. So they're necessary for cell growth and cell function. Um, Think about muscle building protein powers for the microbes. 
And here are some materials that are high in nitrogen, um, kitchen scraps, coffee grounds. These um, alfalfa pellets you can see in the picture here, I believe are available at most um, feed stores. Um, but getting used coffee grounds from, from your local coffee shop is a really good source of nitrogen as well. And I have noticed that um, coffee grounds seem to really help speed up some of that decomposition oh, yeah. of the wood chips. And here are some greens. Again, those veggie scraps from the kitchen. Um, in those veggie scraps, we don't include, however, dairy or meat. Other landscape um, scraps are clean green weeds, but if you're incorporating weeds, don't be incorporating weed seeds. Uh, that can be problematic when you go to apply it as a mulch. And talk a little more about carbon and nitrogen ratio. Ideal for the compost is three to one. So three parts carbon to one part nitrogen. And, you know, this is a general guideline. I don't know any gardener who really analyzes the exact ratio um, of their carbon and nitrogen, but it's a good rule of thumb to think about as you're feeding that pile. Okay, water is one of the essential ingredients. Um, so this is, of course, a crucial part of the habitat for the decomposer, decomposers, and the ideal content is between 40 to 60 percent. You can get probes to measure it, but over time, I think it becomes pretty instinctual. You don't want something that's like a really wet sponge, but something that's like a really moist sponge. So I tend to use my hands more to measure uh, moisture content. And um, some of the probes I've used, they, uh, they didn't seem as so accurate, as accurate as my hands. And air, of course, keeping the pile aerobic is, is essential. Um, so this is, of course, also is just essential for survival and thriving and multiplying and reproducing. Um, and again, we introduce oxygen in different ways. And we're going to talk about diff different systems here shortly. And here's looking at a different, um, a few different manure sources that you might be using, kind of a breakdown of their um, ni nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And looking at their CN ratios. So getting up to the horse manures, your ratio is getting a lot higher. Whereas chicken and rabbit, and even the pig and cattle are lower. So pH, um, as the bacteria and fungi digest and do their thing with the decomposition, they're releasing organic acids. So in the early stages, these acids often accumulate and that results in a drop of the pH, which encourages the growth of fungi and that helps the breakdown of the lignin and cellulose. Um, these acids normally get broken down further during the composting process. And if the system becomes anaerobic, acids can accumulate, lowering the pH and severely limiting microbial activity. So again, remembering those essential ingredients and air is an important one. Optimal pH is a range 5.5 to 8.5. And of course, the lower the pH, the more acidic, the higher the pH, the more alkaline or base. And again, over time, figuring out that right moisture and oxygen component um, that's going to be essential to controlling the pH as well as all the other things that we're talking about. So wood ash is considered to be extremely alkaline. Whereas um, green oak and beech leaves or green pine leaves are acidic. So if these are uh, ingredients you're using, thinking about trying to um, balance those extremely alkaline with some extremely acidic or more acidic components. 
what not to compost, meat, fish, dairy products, bones, pet food, and pet waste. Um, some problematic uh, occurrences that they will bring on flies, wildlife, and the potential to introduce salmonella to the bin. Um, and cat feces can be toxic as well. Again, particle size. The smaller the particle sizes, of course, the quicker these particles are going to decompose. And so when you're planning your pile, you really want to think about what your goals are. Are your goals to really increase the time of this, this process so that you can you know, more quickly produce your compost and get it out into the landscape? Or are you pretty much just kind of having a place to you know, to put in these ingredients. So if you do want to speed up the process, shredding or chopping materials before adding them okay. to the pile or composter would be helpful. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, back to product, um, particle size. So if you do want to increase the speed of the process, you want to get that compost out and into the landscape, um, small, smaller particles by shredding or chopping, you can use leaf shredders, a lawnmower. Um, it's suggested that when you mow materials, uh, you can use a bagging lawnmower before adding it to the pile. Um, and if you have time, add material, materials in these thinner layers to increase the contact between the greens and the browns. So if you, know, you have the time and can be a lot more articulate about that, thinner and more layers will be helpful as well if you're interested in speeding up the process. We're gonna skip the poll. Necessary practices, turning the pile to create pore space. So <clears throat> the optimum is every three to seven days. I think it varies a lot for people. And again, it goes back to what are, the, what are your intentions for this compost? The more frequent the turning, the more air and water you're um, allowing in the pile, and you're going to increase that um, the composting time. I mean, decrease, sorry. Um, this also allows you to monitor the moisture more frequently. Again, squeezing with the, the fistful. Here, the goal is stated one or two drops, one or two drops of water being spread from that squeeze. And again, it's something that over time becomes a lot more just um, into uh, more of an intuition, instinction. Add water or bulking or drying materials as necessary. You want to keep that moisture content 55 to 60. And again, there is um, the compost thermometer that is available to help you uh, check out the temperature if you're concerned about keeping it at that very ideal rate. If you can keep the air and moisture content optimum, this is what the outcome will be. Chemical interaction of carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen um, starts an oxidation that generates carbon dioxide and heat. Again, you wanna get the heat up in this pile. Um, and the correct bacteria and fungi thrive in this environment. Um, how hot is hot enough? So to kill weed seeds and pathogens, the pile should be kept around 104 degrees for at least five days. Temperature should be to exceed 131 for at least four hours during this period and temperatures above 140 degrees, beneficial bacteria begin to perish. I need to go back and check that material because I'm not sure that that's correct and I wanna make sure I get the correct numbers for you. Um, so again, the size and the shape of the bin or the pile. You can have just simple piles or just simple rows, but you don't wanna get um, smaller than kind of a, a square three feet. Um, piles that are too small won't heat up enough and they won't retain moisture. And if you get larger than kind of five feet by five feet, they can get too large. They may spontaneously combust 
But I think what's more common is that um, it becomes extremely labor intensive to turn on a frequent um, basis. And I think some people who have let their pile kind of get out of control in terms of size find it really daunting and uh, it's probably not gonna happen as frequently. And then um, layering the compost, some um, piles exist like this where you do this frequent layering and they add in soil. They add in soil as a cover to the pile. And then um, on the left with the biodynamic style, you have a layer of soil in the middle. And then on the right, you have thinner layers and you have thin layers of soil incorporated as well. Um, I personally have never incorporated soil with my compost, but a lot of people do. Um, I think part of that is soil or moisture retention and part of that is the biology of the soil. Um, again, don't forget your layers of greens and browns and the layer of soil or compost, and that's more frequently what I'll do is I'll in, introduce um, some healthy live compost to the system instead of the soil. Watering the pile. <coughs> Excuse me. And often um, watering the pile as you're stacking it at intervals is going to be important to get consistent water as well. And here's some finished compost coming out of this particular bin. And here's some sifting. And you'll see over to the left, there's some larger particles that you're um, removing. And those are gonna just go right back into the bin. And the finished compost goes through, this, through the screen and here is being caught in a wheelbarrow. And I think this is just a really great homemade system here. Um, just being able to, um, Balance that, that uh, sieve on the top of the wheelbarrow, capture your product there and transport it. And then you're just pushing all of the larger piles into a bucket and throwing them back into the compost bin. Um, and again, just a few more pictures of it. Yes, using the glove to kind of help push that finished material through and then saving the larger material. And here's a pretty nice final pro product. So some troubleshooting with compost, because it might happen, especially in your early days as you're uh, getting more familiar with the process. So if you have strong um, unpleasant odors, that's not a good thing. That means that something is off balance in there. Um, one of those ingredients are, are out of balance. When everything is right, you should not have any bad smells. It's kind of that, what a lot of us appreciate, really organic, earthy smell. Ammonias indicate excess nitrogen. So, um, especially when they're wet. So if that's something that you're experiencing, get some carbon in there. And if it's wet, you know, it's good dry carbon. Sulfur odors are excess carbon. They might create that rotten egg smell. Um, for this, you do the opposite by adding some nitrogen rich material, um, some green material, and then turning the pile. Um, turning it is really gonna help work it through this process. Oh, um, this end note I actually had never thought about, um, but hydrogen sulfide gas is dangerous to human health and it can be explosive. And so um, we are cautioned that it is probably not a good thing to be doing this open composting in a garage or a basement where you're doing the hydrothermic composting. I hadn't thought about that. Slow decomposition. So a no, number of things can cause this. Um, your CN ratio, your browns to your greens could be below 25 to one or above 40 to one. Um, pile might be consistently too wet 
or too dry, not well aerated. And also the outside air temperatures, when they're low enough, they might prevent the pile from reaching optimum temperatures. So these can all kind of inhibit that decomposition process and slow it down. Again, in managing the temperature, we're thinking about the size of the pile or the style of the container, the C-N ratio, moisture and air, and the ambient outside air temperature. Too cold. Is it too cold? Um, increasing the mass of the pile could help by um, self-insulating, adding greens, more nitrogen to the pile, turning the pile, which kind of stokes that biological fire. Um, adding water might help. And then inoculating with soil or compost. You can also insulate a pile or a composter if the air temperature is below freezing. You can do this um, breaking up a straw bale and cover that pile really well. And then um, when the temperatures start warming up, that can be your new um, nesting material or your new browns for this pile. Is the temperature too hot? Again, aerating it will be helpful. Cold water will be helpful and adding topsoil or browns. Um, and then managing for pathogens and weed seeds. And this can sometimes be a little difficult in the backyard system. So there are just certain things to think about. Um, earlier late blight, um, asparagus rust, downy mildew, smut, uh, apple scab, all of these things that um, could survive in a compost pile. So you need to really be uh, careful of what you are introducing to the pile. Uh, at the end of the vegetable garden year, you don't want to be introducing um, crops that have been experiencing um, pathogens. So um, remove and, and so uh, remove the infected plants from the garden, never introduce them to the pile. Um, infected plants really need to go to the landfill. Um, yeah, and I actually hadn't heard about this practice either, but bagging the material in brown paper bag and burying it one foot deep, at least a hundred feet away from your garden, if you would prefer not to send it to the landfill, which is fine too. Um, and really, again, paying attention to the temperature, you really need to get that heat up to best manage pests and pathogens. Um, and again, allowing areas of refuge for beneficial predatory insects in your garden is going to help prevent them in the beginning in your plants, as well as rotating your plant families every year and not planting the same uh, plant family in one spot um, for at least three to four years, if that's possible. And animal pests. Uh, the first and foremost thing is don't introduce something that's gonna be really great food for them and that they're gonna smell and they're gonna be all over. Yes, they can be free buffets. Um, and again, prevention is the best deterrent. That might include ensuring lids and doors are shut tightly, bungee cords or heavy weights. Here you can see some blocks on the top of the bin. Um, and some mice can enter through a quarter inch opening, which can make it pretty difficult um, if mice are a problem for you. I uh, used to work with a three bin system and we're gonna look at that here pretty soon. And, um, they would nest in there and a few times, a couple times, I was turning the bin, one of the piles, and came upon a nest of babies, which was a little unnerving and I just put it back and we just let them run their course at that time. 10 feet away from your house foundation or any buildings is important. Um, and if you're going to be con um, composting food scraps with this method, of composting, um, 
tight sealing container type composters like the one on the right over here. Again, we already talked about what scraps not to put in there um, for one reason why they, because they might attract wildlife. And there's rodent screen or hardware cloth that you can get um, underneath at the bottom to prevent from coming up from the soil um, or uh, in between piles as well. All the food scraps want to go deep inside. You don't want to just leave the food scraps up top of the piles. Um, I mean, parents have a habit of doing this and they're just feeding the neighborhood when they do that. Cover with grass clippings, leaves, soil or compost. And um, yeah, so one, uh, one tip added here is uh, the ability to store grass clippings and leaves and galvanized metal trash cans near your composter to add as needed. So snakes, a lot of people are worried about snakes. They might be considered annoying or scary, but they are natural pest control. So they are assisting you with rodent control. So uh, I actually like to provide some snake habitat in my landscape, which could be, um, you know, my wood pile uh, underneath, they really like to be underneath certain surfaces. So um, putting down plywood and then peeking under it from time to time can be a little educational activity, which is fun. So warm composting, and this is pretty much what I've turned to for a lot of my composting, for my most, most active composting. And uh, when I spoke earlier about browns being nest material, that actually was referring more to worm composting. So here you're really incorporating uh, kitchen scraps, leftovers. Um, you can do it indoors or outdoors, and it can be a lot faster, a lot faster than traditional composting. It can have a smaller footprint and can be a lot easier. Red wigglers are the kind of worm you want to use. So two pounds of these worms can eat one pound of food scraps a day. Um, and the worm castings from vermicompost is considered the absolute richest amendment out there. We call it gardener's gold for a really good reason. It's fantastic material. Uh, small amounts of it can go a long ways. So here's one type of backyard composter. Um, this particular image is from the Seattle Tilt Alliance, and I'm happy to send out the building constructions instructions for this. Uh, it's pretty simple. I've built a few of them before. You're taking one sheet of outdoor plywood and breaking it down to certain dimensions using the entire sheet to create this two by four bin that I think is it's about 18 to 20 inches deep which is ideal for worms. These are not pretty pictures, uh, but this is my utility room. This is an indoor plastic worm bin. And so <clears throat> you have two plastic totes here. The bottom one is meant to capture <clears throat> the um, moisture that needs to drain from the top one. And so <clears throat> the top bin is going to have several very small, like 3 16th inch holes uh, drilled into it for a really good drainage. And then you have a couple of bricks or something to elevate it because you don't want the bottom of that bin to be sitting in that water. You want that water to drain out of that bin. And then in the left-hand picture, you'll see that the inside tote has larger holes around the top rim and that's to allow an adequate oxygen. If this bin is maintained in the right balance, it's not gonna have any bad odors. So this is something that was new to me recently and I'm pretty fascinated with it. And these are electron, electric composters. They're good for indoor composting and they're really good for small spaces. And um, I think they're a lot easier to maintain from what I understand uh, because you're pretty much just putting your products on the top letting it do its job 
and it comes out the bottom. Whereas with the worm bin, it's a little bit more of digging into your bin, getting your scraps down there and adequately covering it. Um, and again, all of these just uh, odors come from poor maintenance. I'm going to send out to everybody who registered for this, along with um, with construction specs, I will send a link to a very brief video that we made that's going over the worm bin, talking about feeding a worm bin and maintaining one. So what compost system is best for you? As we discussed earlier, this depends on what your goals are. So that's something you need to figure out before you choose a pile. Um, if you just want to recycle food and other compostable household waste, vermicompost or electric composters are going to be your way to go. But if you're managing a whole yard of clean green waste, a hot pile is probably going to be the best method for you. And then also consider what is your space. If it's indoor only, then vermicompost and a plastic bin that won't leak or an electric composter are going to be right. And again, backyard the hot pile compost or a worm bin or both, depending on how much material you're gonna have. So these are things you just wanna consider when choosing a system. So here's a hot pile system. This is um, three bin that I've mentioned so far. Uh, there are many different ways to do it. You can look online and find all kinds of DIY examples. The example on the right is one that I've used for for years and um, have really appreciated. And again, I have construction documents from Seattle Tilth um, with how to build these. I'll include those in our follow-up email. And then tumblers, I love tumblers. Um, they are also one of the quicker ways. Um, they're probably the quickest way for hot composting. Um, I used to use the composter on the left and um, let me back up and say the speed of the decomposition <clears throat> is going to be dependent on how frequently and how much you turn it. So um, I oddly enough really enjoyed turning it and got my upper body workout by doing so. And I could really, uh, I think that there were times when in like 10 days I made some really great product. So um, again, you can buy a product such as the one on the left, or you can look for some instructions online on how to build one yourself. And here's a system that I just discovered in the past couple of years, and I haven't used this one yet, the Johnson Sioux Composting Bioreactor. So <clears throat> one drawback for a lot of growers is like the time and the labor of turning and maintaining a pile. And so uh, we're looking for more and more um, options for more passive systems that don't need as much labor. And this one is one. So you're creating, you have the bin, what's holding the compost, and then you're creating these perforated pipes that um, are, 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 that travel through all of the material. So they're introducing oxygen to the pile. Uh, you have to, you do, there's some welding involved in this. And so, um, you either need some pretty good skills yourself or find somebody who can help you. But I think it's, um, it's an exciting alternative and I hope to be experimenting with it more. We're going to be building a um, compost demonstration area next to our office at the state fairgrounds. If you're familiar with our demo gardens out there, uh, it's going to be located right next to that. We haven't started on it but we will be doing that. So look for that one of these days and you can come out and see some of these different systems. So finally, we'll talk about how you're gonna use the compost. So um, you can use it uh, on the lawn. So in establishing a new lawn, you can till it into the soil on an existing lawn. If you have it really finely, finely sifted, you can apply that just as a top dressing to your lawn annually. Um, potted plants, house plants. It's a great, great amendment for your house plants. Um, here's a potting soil recipe available and you can find these online as well. And then for plants that are already potted, you can put a thin layer over the soil. 
<laughs> oh yes, don't put plants in pure compost. That's not gonna be a healthy environment for the roots. Just incorporate it into the soil or apply it as a mulch. So planting trees and shrubs, um, really great for that as well. You're gonna be mixing that compost into the soil from the planting hole, and you might put some in the hole and incorporate it into the bottom soil down there in what's going to become the root zone of the new plant. Um, here it's recommended one third compost to two thirds soil in <clears throat> the soil from the planting hole. Um, thinking of in poor soil, roots can become the equivalent of a pot bound staying in the nutrient rich soil. So in poor soils, um, think about making that planting hole larger and really incorporating that compost into the soil. Uh, and that's going to allow those um, compacted roots to, or those roots to um, really spread out in that hole uh, and um, not fight that poor soil as much. And of course, in the garden, in the spring or the early summer before you're planting, uh, you can turn in to the soil some of your compost, um, adding four inches and turning it in. Um, through the growing season, you can sprinkle it again, kind of like a mulch as a top dressing. And then a fall, you can apply some to unfinished compost that can then again be turned into the spring. So really just sparking the biology of um, that unfinished compost. And then as a mulch in the landscape. Here, um, early summer, we're looking at two to six inches. <clears throat> on top of the soil around trees and bushes. Um, you can also apply some in your annual or um, perennial areas. Uh, compost, so particularly for a mulch, um, keeping down weeds. Uh, compost from woody materials works really well. Um, I really like a mulch that's used a lot of wood chips to be planting when it comes to weed suppression. With the annuals and perennials, however, you want a mulch um, that has broken down more. And for plant starting mixes. So um, you want a high quality mature, you want a mature compost for this mix. Um, ensuring that the sterilization has happened during the compost at high temperatures. Here's a recipe for plant starter mixes. You can find more of these online as well. Here is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime with questions. I love to talk about compost and gardening. Um, so I am available. Again, the follow-up that I have with you all is to, I'm gonna send you two different construction specs. Uh, one for a two by four worm bin, and then one for a three bin turning system for a hot system. I'm also gonna send you a link to a video that we made about um, maintaining your worm bin. I'm gonna stop sharing now, and then we can take any questions that might be out there if there are any questions. And feel free at this point to um, unmute, turn on your video and have a conversation. No questions out there? Is anybody here considering composting or already composting and ready to change it up at all? I see I, uh, I'm Diane in Vandenberg County and I, have a vermi compost in my basement that I love. And then I also have a compost bin outside that I don't take as good a care of, but you've really encouraged me to start turning it because I, I need to turn it more often. Yeah. So I'm glad I sat in to hear. But something that really caught my eye was the last slide that compost used, compost use and you have the plant starter mixes mm -hmm. the picture on there has that plant starter but it looks like those containers are made out of newspaper they are 
They Can you are, do that, bro? There's actually a, um, a tool out there, and I don't know what the name of it is, although I, um, I've been, I've demonstrated it before. It's like a little wooden um, mold that you're supposed to fold the newspaper in certain ways, and then you wrap it around this mold and tighten it up, and those can become um, starts for you. I am very interested in that because I'm a master gardener also, and I'm always looking for ways to save money and use products that can be incorporated into the soil. So that, that picture really caught my eye. And I'll look for instructions on that. Oh, thank you so much. Um, you know, that reminds me, there was a, a picture there that I wanted to discuss and I breezed by it. And that was about mulching around trees. And um, gosh, I'm, I'm gonna pull it back up because this is so important. Okay, how many people have seen the picture on the right? What we call volcano mulching where nobody knows how far down the actual root system of this, how many feet of mulch are sitting against the bark of these trees. This is so wrong and it's something that happens so much around here. That's what we call again, volcano mulching. Those trees aren't gonna last very long. That was really a waste of planting. To the left, however, you're seeing correct, what we call more kind of a donut mulching. So the mulch is down at the base of the plant. It's not up against the bark of the tree and it's not going to be inducing the rot that that volcano on the right is going to be doing. So that was one point I really wanted to, I continue to try and drive home um, is this mulching practice. It's so very important if we really wanna maintain our canopies. So um, sorry for taking us back to that and for missing it in the first place, but it is a message that um, I hope everybody will get out there more. Stop volcano mulching. Um, so Bobby, it looks like is asking, how do you feel about composting additives? Um, sure, yeah, we didn't discuss them here today, but uh, there are different things you can add to your pile. Um, I think that there are products out there that are already um, a mix of ingredients to help um, it, to help really kind of bolster your composting process, especially in the beginning. And then um, I haven't used different additives for nitrogen, like blood meal or bone meal or anything like that, but I know that people do. So Bobby, does that help with your question? If Bobby's still here. <laughs> Jenny, you're so right. And I hope to be working on some programming around that. Um, education is so, so very important for our landscapers out there and our home gardeners. So thank you for that. We're working on it. Brooke, I, I found that if I add uh, bone meal, that really attracts the raccoons and other Oh, creatures. and the blood meal might also, huh? Yes. Um, I've yeah. added, I used to add it to planting holes, but then <laughs> the creatures would dig everything up. <laughs> okay, that's an interesting point. Yeah, I think somebody um, somebody was talking about um, add, when adding it to the garden, it attracting rodents as well. Mm. Um, so maybe not adding it as a top dress. So Ruth is asking like with the newspaper, do you tear it up into strips and other paper such as mail? And that's a really good question. Um, best practices, yes, um, tearing it up. As we were talking about particle sizes, uh, when I very first started composting with worms, I just was stripping newspaper after newspaper after newspaper and making uh, nice big nests for worms um, and soaking it in water before putting it into the bin. Well, soaking it in water in a bucket, wringing it out to get it to like that, that best content that you want. So the more you can break that down, the better. Um, and you can use paper such as mail, but um, you wanna be careful about what's on it. So if it has a little plastic window, 
you don't want that to go in there. But um, again, paper products that are going in are gonna need some moisture at some point. Um, I often, I keep a canister on my kitchen counter and if it's got some dry material in there, I just, you know, will add a little water there to the canister before it even goes into the bin. Um, so, but you know, it's, um, it's a practice that I feel very strongly about um, when we consider the amount of food waste that happens in this and other countries around the world. Um, it's at least one and really the last element in reducing waste. Um, so, and preventing it from going to the landfill as well. So doing that more with food scraps that really don't need to be in a landfill with paper products, household products, um, anything that can be diverted and just um, be used on site and just stopping the cycle there. Any more questions or comments? I used a tumbler for a while and I realized that I didn't have enough carbon sources going in because it was a, a rotting, smelly mm. mess, just putting vegetable scraps in. So now I'm going to try it again and make sure I add more brown material. Good. Yeah, that balance is so important. One pest that we didn't discuss that um, can be a problem, especially with if you're indoor composting with a, um, um, with a worm bin, you really need to get those scraps buried down and they need to be covered well. If those scraps aren't buried, those fruit flies can find them, lay eggs, and then you have a hatch of fruit flies in the house that um, doesn't do much for the reputation for a worm compost. So uh, really being able to um, get the, the feeder material down and covered. And again, the link that I'm gonna share for the video is gonna discuss these things um, because it's the proper maintenance is not a difficult thing, but it's just important to know the different aspects of it. And um, indoor vermicomposting, I think the <clears throat> biggest challenges that concern people are fruit flies and the odor. And if it's done right, you won't have either. So Jenny said she started a bin made out of discarded pool storage bin and included multiple banker boxes of papers that needed to shred. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just such a good process. Yeah, I, I was just gonna say, I, I looked into having paying to have them shredded and I was, when I saw the cost, I'm like, I'm gonna find another way to get rid of these. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I ripped them up myself as small as I could and kind of did it over a process of days and actually probably more weeks and we'll see how it goes, but so far so good. Good, good, that's great. Yeah. 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 So you, you know, you're taking care of it. You're ending the cycle of waste right there and reusing it in your landscape. And I love that. Um, so Bobby says she uses a rotating compost bin to break down the vegetable waste before placing it in the leaf composting pile to keep the raccoons away. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah, it sounds like it, it works. Um, and yeah, burying Bearing them in that pile is going to be um, very helpful as well. Any more questions tonight? My contact information will be in the follow up email as well. So if you ever want to reach out, let me know if you have groups of people that would like um, a presentation such as this. Uh, let me know. Hit me up. Be happy to do it. Thank um, you all for being here. Sarah, yeah. One more question. What about composting um, walnut leaves? Should yeah, that's probably problematic. Yeah, we didn't talk about that, did we? Um, I am not sure. I just had this conversation um, the other day. I don't know if anybody here knows. If, if you do, please unmute and let us know about how long the laleopathic properties of the walnut material, how long they persist. And um, because I don't know, I just really um, steer people away from adding walnut material to a compost. Thanks for that question. Well, if that's everything, I just, again, wanna thank you all for being here tonight, spending a little time talking about compost. I love to talk about it myself, obviously. And again, hit me up with any 
future events or any questions you might have. Appreciate it.